Welcome to the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff, along with William Swig. William, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. We have two great returning guests. First, it's objectivist legend Andrew Bernstein, and uh, he's actually got some new fiction. He's just released Brooklyn Stories, which I look forward to talking about in a few moments. And also returning today is superfan Dave Goodman. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. William, I, I, I thought the name of the show should be the Swig and Ship Show, but, you know, I guess you, I guess, <laughs> I guess you prefer Iron Man Fan Club. Okay, well, well it's, your, it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> it's interchangeable. We'll, uh, we'll take that, uh, we'll, we'll consider that name change. Um, yeah, swig, swig and Ship, it raises the question, what is Ship Swigget? you know? So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been accused of that before. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, one of the things, and, and I want to thank you both for joining us, we wanted to discuss the uh, kind of Kyle Rittenhouse uh, verdict. Uh, he was found not guilty um, in the case. And William, I, I think you wanted to do kind of like a, a slight recap on it. Yes. So uh, I have just reviewed the testimony that Kyle gave in, in the trial. So I'm more familiar with it uh, than I was a week ago. Uh, although I did watch some of the trial uh, while it was happening, I didn't watch all of it, but I did watch all of his testimony uh, just yesterday. So I wanted to just give a quick recap of the events and what happened. I don't want to um, get bogged down in a lot of the details because really we're going to focus on you know things that happened after the trial and our thoughts about various aspects of it. And we're not going to go into great detail about the trial itself. But basically, the core information is that <clears throat> during the Kenosha riots last year on August 25th, 2020, uh, Kyle was in Kenosha with his friend, uh, Dominic Black, and they were asked to, or they offered to help out um, defending or protecting this car dealership and they went there with uh, rifles and during the evening they got into uh, Kyle got separated and he got into an altercation with the mob that was out there rioting and burning things down and he ended up shooting um he ended up killing two people and wounding one other and shooting at another one that he missed. And these are all people who were either chasing him or attacking him and threatening his life. Um, one guy was, we know now, basically a psychotic pedophile who had just been released from the mental health hospital. His last name was Rosenbaum. And he threatened to kill Kyle and do, you know, bad things to him and started chasing him and Kyle was feeling threatened and he was running away, but he couldn't get away. And so he ended up shooting this guy several times and killing him. And then as he fled to go to the police, the mob started chasing him and one guy attacked him with a skateboard and he shot that guy and killed him. Another guy is a little more iffy because it wasn't clear whether he was, uh, whether this guy was pointing his gun at him, but he did have a gun. And Kyle says that he saw the gun and that the guy started lowering that pistol and at him. And so that Kyle shot him. And this was all in the context of Kyle running away from a mob and being attacked. People were throwing rocks at him. People were hitting him with skateboards. Some random guy they called jump kick guy. He kicked Kyle in the head. So Kyle was basically surrounded by these people on the ground, uh, fighting for his life, and he had to shoot certain people who got too close and tried to grab his gun. Um, <clears throat> then he was William. William, let me jump in for a second here. Sure. Did it, didn't Grosskreutz or Grosskreutz acknowledge on the witness stand yes. that Kyle didn't shoot until he started, until he pointed his gun at him? He did. Yes, that came out in the trial, and Grosskreutz is a disgusting character in my opinion because on the trial in the trial he admitted that and then he went literally that day or the next day he went on tv and did an interview where he tried to backtrack and say he didn't 
So, so what, he, what he said under oath was different than what he said when he wasn't under oath. Yeah, he, he's literally two-faced. Uh, he says one thing under oath, which I guess we have to assume is the truth because they would have called him on it. I mean, they have video of this, so it's, it's hard for him to deny because they actually showed him the video during the trial of him pointing, lowering the gun and pointing it at Kyle. So he couldn't really lie in that situation. But when right, he gets, right. when he's not under oath and on TV and the news gets at him and you have people like Good Morning America saying, oh, we're not in the trial. You can say whatever you want here. Well, then, yeah, then he, then he like starts lying and says, oh, no, I wasn't pointing my gun. So uh, that guy's a real character. And uh, really, he's a disgusting leftist, basically, in essential terms. Um, yeah, and what anybody says under oath, I think would, would need to be taken more seriously than what they say when they're not under oath, especially when they're being egged on by the lie and leftist media. Right. That, that, that's a good summary, William. I mean, for me, I just want to jump right in and say that, uh, you know, my real issue is with these libertarians and other people kind of caving to the left with this whole Kyle shouldn't have been there. And, you know, saying he shouldn't have been there is accepting the leftist double standard that they're mostly peaceful riots are to be accepted as a metaphysical given and that, that we don't have a right to assemble or defend our property if it interferes with their emotional rampages. Yeah, the main um, argument I've heard is that he was too young, like he was 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard people say that we don't allow 17 year olds to vote or drink. So why should they be allowed to carry a rifle? And I, I just think this is um, basically an ageist argument. It's prejudiced against young people. I think that anyone, no matter what their age is, has a right to defend themselves. And if you're going to be going into a situation like a riot, it's common sense. It's rational to carry a gun no matter what age you are, as long as you're trained to use that gun. And even if you only have a vague familiarity with guns it might be rational to bring it into a situation like that i i think you know a much more important question to ask than why kyle rittenhouse was there is why don't the authorities stop these rioters why why do the authorities let these riot riots go on that destroy a great deal of property and kill innocent people at times because i think it's morally right. Well, the right thing, obviously, is for the authorities to suppress these riots and do it with whatever force is necessary, uh, in, including terminal force. I mean, you, there's no right to riot. And if you engage in riots, you, you have to realize you might get killed by the authorities, uh, you know, by, by the police. And, that's, and that would be the morally right thing to do. If the authorities will not stop riots, and they didn't you know, all, of, all of last summer, then I think it's morally right for vigilantes to step in and, and, and do what they can if, you know, the, to, to protect property and, and, in, and innocent lives. So I, I, think, I think more of us should, should have been there, more, you know, more, you know, more armed American patriots who care about, uh, care about innocent lives and care about private property. I think more of us should have been there uh, in order to you know, stop the riot, riots and, and, if necessary, kill the rioters. I think that's the morally right thing to do if the legal authorities won't do their job. Yeah, the uh, government monopoly on force that we give up is based on the idea that they won't abdicate their role to some woke mob. Right, right. Well, if I could just say something about the ageism, I mean, I think age is legitimate. You can't just say, well, it's ageist. I mean, what if, what if a 15 year old came with a gun? You know, I, I think there's a false alternative. I think obviously the rioters had no right to be there, but that doesn't mean it was a wise decision for him to show up. Even if he's trained, he's alone, you know, with a gun, they see his, the youth on his face. He looks innocent. That's why I think Rosenbaum went after him. And he just went through a year and a half of hell of, you know, he could have lost his freedom for the rest of his life. So, you know, again, it goes when you know, the police are defunded and neutered, you're going to get things like this. But I don't know if we should look at Kyle as a hero, which is what I think a lot of people on the right are doing. Well, he we can there. Into, 
we could get into what is a hero, but in terms of whether it was a wise decision or not, that's his decision to make. I mean, he's a young man with ideas of his own, principles of his own. They may, may not be your principles. You may not be able to take that risk to defend what you consider to be your community. Because we know from the trial that Kyle worked in that community, he recently got a job as a, as at the recreation facility in Kenosha um, as a lifeguard. So he had skills and he had work in Kenosha. He, had, that, he considered that his second community. And um, I think he was willing to take the risk to put himself out there on the streets protecting uh, this car dealership. And of course, he needed the gun to protect his own life. So his, his, he's got family members in Kenosha, doesn't he? His father lives there. His, his father family. lives there. His aunt, his uncle and his cousins all live in Kenosha. So and he had a best friend in Kenosha. Mm -hmm. So he had a lot of connections there. I think that he it, it's un, undeniable that that was one of his communities. And, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly consider him a hero. You know, I think yeah. when the when the when the law does not do its job and does not protect innocent lives and the property of innocent persons, mm -hmm. then then we as private citizens need to step up, we, we, regardless of age. Um, if this if, if this was a ten year old kid who had defended private property against the rampaging mob, you know, I, I would consider him doing doing the right thing. He's, um, uh, and I think I think it was really a. a, a yeah, I know you guys want to discuss the trial, right? Go um, ahead, whatever. Say what oh, you okay. want. Oh, okay. Yeah, because um, I think the the purpose of the trial. I mean, clearly, he he acted in self defense. The video shows that, uh, and I don't think charges should have ever have been brought against him. But I think the trial and then the the outrage, you know, from from the leftist media and, and from uh, uh, Biden was a candidate at that time. You know, the outrage from the left. I think the purpose of, the, of this whole uh, attack on Rittenhouse is the left wants to teach us a lesson. And, and the lesson is that you cannot defend yourself against leftist rioters. So, so that if you know, the, the law won't defend uh, innocent people and private property against leftist rioters uh, and, and leftist terrorists, which I consider Antifa and Black Lives Matter, I consider both terrorist organizations. And then uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is condemned to life imprisonment, let's say, uh, shows us that private individuals, vigilantes, can't uh, defend themselves or innocent other people and the property of innocent other people against the, le the rioting leftist mob, then I think the left has, the left has shown us that in that, in that case, if they, if they won that, that trial, the left has shown us that you can't, there's not, there's not any defense now against, uh, against the, the leftist terrorist organizations. I think that was the purpose of the trial and the mm -hmm. outrage. Thank God, thank God they lost because it shows honest Americans and American patriots that we could still defend ourselves or innocent others or the property of, of innocent people against these uh, leftist terrorist organizations. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as our discussion goes on, guys, I think we can link this to uh, totalitarian movements of the past because Hitler did this in Germany with his, uh, his brown shirts. Mussolini did it in, um, you know, in, in Italy. And I want to do a little research. I think, I think Lenin had a uh, you know, mob at his disposal also, but I'm not sure about that. But I, but I, know, uh, I know Hitler and, and Mussolini did. And I, and I think these are the storm, uh, Antifa Black Lives Matter are the stormtroopers, the brown shirts, you know, the, uh, of, of, the, of the contemporary leftist movement. And, and thank God uh, we still have, the trial shows we still have the right to defend ourselves against them. But I think that was the purpose of, of this whole attack on Rittenhouse was to show us that uh, nobody's going to defend nobody's going to defend innocent lives or private property against against the leftist terrorist organizations. Not the authorities and and private individuals or vigilantes can't do it either. I think that was the whole purpose of this yeah, attack on, I, on Rittenhouse. We saw the same thing with the uh, McCloskeys, the uh, lawyers in St. Louis that defended themselves with uh, right, guns right. against the mob, and they didn't even shoot anybody, and they were charged. Right. Not right. all the people that, you know, went on their property or were destroying things later that night. Well, Andy, I know you made this point, you and Bosch made this point on your podcast because I watched it. And I thought this is a great point. 
because not only can you tie it to past uh, movements against private property like the Nazis and the commies, you can tie it to the prosecution against Kyle. The prosecution, one of the main points of the prosecution was asking this repeated question um, about using deadly force to protect property. They were, they were harping on this and the prosecution said, this is what it's all about. It's like Kyle used force. Kyle went to the car dealership to protect the property. And the, and, and the prosecution said, that was your purpose. And so your purpose wasn't to go off the property and help people and all that. And so the prosecution was making a point where you can't use deadly force to protect property. And I think you, you can and you should because property should be defended. And if you have to kill someone who's trying to destroy your property, uh, that's what you have to do in order to protect your property. But the prosecution is, is trying to undermine that right. And they were attacking Kyle because he went there to protect property. As a technical right. le legal matter, I don't, you can't use deadly force to defend property and you can't use deadly force against ordinary physical force. So like, that's the thing with the Rosenbaum. Like if a guy just pushes you and you shoot him, you're in some hot water. Now you could say with Rosenbaum, he was grabbing his gun, which is another level. But I, I do know, I've talked to some attorneys, you're not supposed to use uh, deadly force to defend property, only human life. I think, I, I believe that's how the law is. Where, there has to be a line, right? Because if someone's trying to burn down your building, then <laughs> shouldn't you be able to shoot them? I, well, I don't, I'm not an attorney. I just, I know the examples given, let's say, you know, someone breaks in your home and he's running out with your TV or he steals your vehicle and you shoot him, you're going to get prosecuted. If he's burning down your home or your business, is that deadly force, even if no one's in the building, but it is your livelihood being destroyed? I don't know. Maybe you could say morally. Yeah, absolutely. That's Burn fine. As, yeah, as a, as a legal point uh, for that circumstance is fine. But Dave, I mean, there is an issue with people in objectivism that are not standing up enough for the right to defend property. They're just there. It's easier to say, oh, he shouldn't have been there. Or, mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's we've and, and uh, you know, to your own credit, last night he was saying, "Yes, you know, all these uh, state of uh, uh, robberies going on, you know, are wrong, and they need to be stood up against." But honestly, I mean, we needed someone saying that last summer, when, uh, and, and I know some people were, but you know, that's when, in terms of differentiating objectivism and standing up, but to do that would be to face attacks. Uh, intellectually, the similar to what Kyle faced, and I don't. I'm not a lawyer, obviously, and I don't know what the law says, uh, and, and it may vary from state to state, for all I know. But uh, I know what the law should say, and that is morally, I think uh, honest persons have the right to use any force necessary to defend their property, as uh, to defend their property, because in defending your property, you are defending your life. If if we don't have the right. To private property, then then we can't live. Um, you know, if if somebody can burn down my house or steal my wallet or you know or or, or steal my car, uh, all all of these things that my my livelihood and you know and my my life depend on, then you know I can't I can't live. I, I I morally I need to any any honest person needs to be able to use whatever force is necessary to the to defend themselves against thieves. And the moral imperative then you know should be very clear. Don't be a thief. Don't, uh, you know, don't right. steal the guy's honest person's car or burn down the dealership or break into his house or you know, steal his wallet or anything like that. And then your life won't be in any danger from honest from honest persons. But I do think more morally, I think our lives depend upon uh, the right to private property. And consequently, we have the moral right to use any force necessary to defend ourselves against thieves, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and arsonists and and and. And all of these uh, uh, cr criminals, uh, I think I think that's it's, it's it's really important to stand up, you know, for this point. And if we do that and make it very clear, if the law makes makes that very clear, I think that will certainly have a salutary impact on robberies. And uh, you know, I think there'll be less fewer your know, robberies and break-ins and things like that.
Yeah. If you run someone down with your car and then you don't have to pay any bail to get out, you might think it's okay to run people down with your cars, as, as we saw in Wakesha uh, after the verdict. Although yeah, I hate, to, I hate to sound like I'm prescient here, but, you know, I, I published an essay a few years ago with, uh, you know, Mark DeCuna at capitalismmagazine.com on the, the, more, the more right to gun ownership. And I, and I predicted in that essay that there would be more uh, vehicular homicide, okay, you know, deliberate v- vehicular homicide cases. The, the, the really egregious one was that jihadist in Nice on, yeah. on Bastille Day where he killed, he ran, ran, he killed like 86 people, you know, in a, in a, in a rented truck. He had guns, as I recall, but he used the truck. And I think, I, I, unfortunately, I think we're going to see we're going to see more uh, more of this. Um, but 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 you know that's a direct attack on on somebody's lives. I, I do think the attack on property is an indirect attack on somebody's somebody's lives. And again, I want I'm going to stand up and say it as loud as I can. Uh, if somebody's stealing your property, I think you have the, an honest person has the right to use whatever force is necessary morally has the right to use whatever force is necessary to defend his property against a bad guy. And I think the law should stand on those moral grounds to do the same. Well, Andy, if, you know, if, someone, if think, someone steals your car, you're not going to, you're going to call the police, right? We're supposed to offload <clears throat> violence to a, the state is a monopoly on violence. So we're not supposed to just chase the guy who stole our car, right? We want to minimize that level of cowboy. Um, can can you draw cowboy. your gun on him? I don't know if that would be considered brandishing or a, a proper defensive display of a firearm. I don't know. I'd like to, sorry, yeah. I'd like to jump in real quick. And I think one of the problems here is the this political context. If you if we're in a civil society where you can where you have confidence in the police and that they're going to protect your property, then yes, you don't shoot someone for stealing your car. You go to the police and report it. And then have them track the guy down or right. find your car. But if you're in a riot context where civilization is broken down, the police are overwhelmed and can't do their jobs, it's up to you to protect your property. Mm-hmm. And if shooting someone to stop them from stealing your car, then that's what you have to do. I mean, that you you can't rely on the police. See, I see, I think I get your point, but I think even in a civilized society, you know, the police may not be able to find. You call. I mean, get get it to a chop shop immediately, you know, and uh, and chop it up. Though I think shooting the guy who's stealing your car, even in in certainly threatening him with a gun, and then if he doesn't get out of the car, shooting him. I think that's morally the right thing to do. You are protecting your property. I think you have every moral right to shoot a guy who's stealing your car. And again, I, I think if the car thief wants to protect his life, it's very simple: don't steal cars. You know, then then you won't be in 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 the danger of being shot. By an honest person, and I've seen interviews with you know convicted felons in various state penitentiaries, and they all, they all say the same thing: they don't fear being apprehended by the police nearly as much as they fear being shot by an armed victim. Mm-hmm. Um, and so well, I think that- you know, I think you know, if we make this very clear that the victim has the moral right to use whatever ever uh, degree of force he's necessary to defend his property against the bad guys. I think they'll, you know, that there'll be less, there'll be less theft, there'll be less uh, violent, there'll be less crime of, of any kind. Well, that's an interesting point because it's it gets on, it gets to a sort of gray zone between police effectiveness and ineffectiveness, where even if you're in a semi-civilized society, the police are still ineffective at catching the criminals, and they don't have the capability to get car thieves, for example. But yeah, if the cops, say- if the cops are right there. They're across the street and you can wave them over, then sure. But, you know, if you have to call the cops, the, the, the car thief could be long gone with your car by the time the, the, the cops are right. Right. Now, right. I, to me, it, it's at least as much about the fact that these it's because of the laws that these guys thought they had the right to rush Kyle, that he should, you know, even the prosecutor said everyone takes a beating as if he should, you know, they should have just let him take the gun and hopefully administer just a beating and not kill him. Is it, that's the way the law is supposed to work? I mean, we should be, I think, focused more on what the law should be as, as much as what it is, because what it is, is is part of what's created the problems we're seeing today and the people thinking they, they don't have to respect the law. Yeah, morally, no honest person should have to take a beating. The, 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 <laughs> let, let's get the prosecutor out behind the tool shed and give him you know, uh, a beating. That's you know, 
that's <laughs> that makes that makes sense to me. No, the, point is, a gun, the point of having a gun is so you don't have to take a beating. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, I think they were trying to punish Kyle with the process. They knew they were not going to get a conviction. They just thought they'd make this kid's life a living hell for a year and a half. <laughs> and teach the rest of us a lesson. This is what's going to happen to you if you defend, you know, innocent lives or, or, the, or the property of innocent persons. Well, if you look think- since COVID, uh, the left has made rioting, shoplifting and not paying rent normal. All when every state in America, you don't have to pay rent. You can't get evicted. Shoplifting, you won't be prosecuted rioting i guess that's you know a legitimate form of protest so yeah there is a war on private property i agree yeah it's gotten so bad i won't even vote for democrats anymore <laughs> well, have. Well, hey can we touch on one other thing regarding sure. kyle here um in self-defense so one other thing um that the prosecution brought up was that uh rosenbaum was making verbal threats to kyle and you don't have a right to defend yourself against verbal threats. But again, I think it depends on the context. If you can't go to the police and say, this guy's threatening my life, how do you prevent this guy from acting on his threats? Because he's clearly thinking that he wants to kill you and he's threatening to do it. Um, you know, I, I think of movies where people threaten the hero and he just shoots them. You know, it's because why are you going to allow someone to threaten to rape your wife? You know, if some guy's threatening to rape your wife, why are you, are you going to let him try to do it? Or are you just going to shoot him and put him down? You got to wait till he tries. Otherwise, you, you're going to get a manslaughter. Try. But if, um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll think of it. Well, did Rosenbaum physically assault Kyle or, or did he not? Or did he only threaten him? I think he grabbed his gun. Well, he yeah. threatened him, threatened him initially, and then started chasing him. And then Kyle was running away. And then Kyle turned at one point and pointed his gun at him. And then Rosenbaum kept coming. Full and speed. So then, and then Rosenbaum, and then Rosenbaum kept chasing him. And then Kyle start, tried to run away, but he kind of got cornered in some cars, and there was a crowd around, so he didn't feel he could get away. And he turned around and just shot him because this guy, this guy was a maniac. I mean, they have him on video asking people to shoot him he, he was literally straight out of a mental hospital yeah no the prosecutor said look why didn't kyle have any less lethal why does he have a why doesn't he have pepper spray he just has a, an assault rifle he could have had a taser you know he didn't have to only use a deadly force the prosecution was very good at like coming up with things kyle should have done but kyle, but when someone is chasing you uh, and all you, and you, all you've brought is this rifle. That's what you use. I mean, I don't think you have to get into a fist fight with someone uh, mm-hmm. just to avoid not having to use your gun. I mean, just because someone doesn't have a gun, uh, that doesn't mean that they can't kill you. This guy was a maniac, and Kyle probably thought, you know, this guy could probably kill me or get my gun and then shoot me. So he basically had to shoot him. I think. And I morally, the attacks on self-defense are disturbing, uh, you know, to put it mildly. Like I was in England a few years ago, you know, doing, uh, giving some lectures. And there was a, f- a famous case that happened at the time where some, some bad guy broke into the house of an elderly couple. And um, uh, the hu- they were, I think the husband and wife were in their 70s. And the, the husband stabbed the guy with a, I think with a kitchen knife and, you know, and, and, and killed him. And, and they arrested, they arrested the husband, brought him up on charges. Um, there was so much outrage in, in England over this. I think, I think the charges were dropped, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember for sure, but cer- certainly the no charges should have been brought, I think, you know, against, against somebody who, who stabs an intruder uh, in his, in his house. Um, but, you know, I, it's gotten so bad in, in England. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, if you guys know the, the facts of this situation. I think uh, women very often have to carry a, a whistle, a rape, a rape whistle, because they're, they're not even allowed to use to carry pepper spray, you know, to spray against an assailant who's trying to rape her. And I think I think that's the case. I'll, I'll let me put it hypothetically. If it is the case, that is morally wrong. Yeah, I, 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 you know, a, 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 a woman should be allowed to defend herself against a rapist by any means necessary. Uh, if he doesn't intend to physically beat her or, or, or kill her, 
Well, oh, well, fine. That might raise the assailant one rung in hell. But if he's going to rape her, I think you know uh, she has the right to use a gun or pepper spray or, or whatever it takes to defend to defend herself and not have to rely on a whistle, you know, to, to, to try and bring hell. So the, the attack on on self defense uh, in, in England is a relatively civilized country, and we're starting to see we're starting to see it here as well with the attack on gun ownership, the attacks on Kyle Rittenhouse for well, defending. The left does it- Morally, they say, you know, our way is inevitable. You're a white supremacist anyway. Don't even fight us and defend yourself. Right, right, right. I think uh, maybe my disagreement with Andy here is there's an issue of proportionality. Like, obviously, with rape, okay, then you could use deadly force, but stealing property, because property could be replaced, life cannot be replaced. I think that's what the law is taking into account. That's why, you know, if someone's stealing your iPhone and you shoot them, you get prosecuted. So I think, yeah, proportionality has to be uh, taken into account in self-defense. Well, you know, the life of a, of a criminal shouldn't be replaced. And, um, you know, if you, if, if, you kill, uh, if you kill the bad guy, I think you've done humanity a great service. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, bad guys could turn into good guys, right? We have free will. Maybe you're a kid and you're a shoplifter and then, you know, you, you, you grow out of it and become an, an objectivist or something. So it's not... How- how much do you have to do a threat assessment of what this guy is going to do with my gun after he gets it from me? No, with guns, anyone who goes for your gun, that's deadly force. You could use deadly force. But I was talking to issues with the uh, property theft and using deadly force. Because that's ultimately what happens. You say to some guy, hey, you know, get your hands off my car. And then he, you know, may rush you for your gun. You know, I think we need to make it very clear. I get your point, Dave. I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we, we need to make it very clear morally and, um, you know, and politically, uh, you know, and, and start this, you know, from day one of a, of a child's life. Parents should know this and, and you know, and teach their, teach their children that if you're a criminal, uh, honest people have the right to defend themselves with, with any amount of force necessary. And I, and I don't think, to me, proportionality doesn't make any, any sense. Um, if somebody's if somebody's going to try and beat you with his fists and you have a gun or a weapon to defend yourself, I don't think you need to get into a fist fight with the guy. You, you shoot him if necessary or, you know, or at, least, at the very least, threaten him. And hopefully he runs away. And if he doesn't and he comes at you, you 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 shoot him. I think the, the right to self-defense uh, supersedes any any issue of proportionality. And again, I think the principle is our lives depend on property. P- property could be replaced. Yeah. But. You know, somebody may not be able to afford, you know, a, another car or a, another house that the arsonist is is burning down, or you know, or or, or things like that, um, or even or even a, an iPhone. So I, I I do think again we we teach everybody from day one, parents, schools, legal system, social media, online, everywhere that people have the right to use whatever force is necessary to defend themselves against thieves and in, and any other type of criminals. And if you want to protect your life. Uh, not be any danger from honest persons. Don't be a criminal. And I think, I think I think that's morally right. And I think it sends a very strong message to, uh, you know, to people who are on the fence about being criminals or not, you know, engaging in criminal behavior or not. I'll just add on uh, Dave's point about proportionality. I think there is a concept of excessive force. So I think the the standard should be you you stop the threat. So if if someone's coming at you, trying to rape you, then you have every right to shoot them until they stop. Uh, but if they are lying on the ground, motionless, and then you just pump full, um, you know, magazine. full round, um, full magazine of bullets into their head, I think that's excessive, and you should be prosecuted. Um, but I think that there are cases where, you know, if a little, if a teenage boy is coming into your store and he steals some stuff, I don't think you you have the right to just shoot them dead. Right. I think, yeah, I think that, would, are, be, that would be excessive for the force. finer points of law, but I think Andy makes a good point. With whatever rules of engagement we accept, we're ultimately incentivizing behavior and it's going in a direction. And as we've been implementing these soft on crime policies for however many of the last years, you know, now we've got it to where there are these roving organized gangs that have built up to, to steal from these stores all over California or wherever else the rule of law is breaking down. 
Yeah, I, don't, I think we need to have our empathy for the innocent persons, not for the thugs and the criminals. And if, uh, you know, if proprietors want to put big signs up in their shop windows and inside the stores, uh, shoplifters will be shot. <laughs> you know, I think we're going to see a lot less shoplifting. Yeah. Well, Andy, what, Andy, what would you say about like, let's say some teenage kid comes in and is trying to steal some candy or something. You wouldn't, you wouldn't agree that the shopkeeper can shoot him, right? Oh, I, I mean, if he's, if he's stealing candy, I would, I, and if I was the store owner, I would certainly point the gun at him and, you know, and, and, and tell him, put it back. I think, uh, I think it's a shopkeeper's responsibility to figure some way out to figure some way to deal with that without killing the kid. Mm -hmm. I think right. maybe, no, I think maybe that, have automatic yeah. locks on the doors. He can lock the kid inside or something like that. Yeah. Obviously you take context into account, but it just is a question of, you know, have uh, overall as a society, are we too hard on crime or too soft on crime? Well, well too someone, soft, too soft. Definitely. Right. And so we can make some changes without letting it be open season on kids that shoplift. Yeah. We, so, we need to establish what's the standard for self-defense, for what's proper, you know, and we're trying to figure out what is excessive force, what's good proportionality, bad proportionality. Right. Things like that. That's what, yeah, that's why I think it's too simplistic to say, oh, well, he's stealing my candy. I'm going to shoot him or point a gun at him. I think there has to be levels, there's gradations here. Yeah. But I mean, the prosecution in the Kyle case was saying he shouldn't even have reacted to the guy trying to take his weapon. But that's ridiculous. Yeah. It's a uh, part of with, a, Kyle, with Kyle, it was a self defense issue. He wasn't, he wasn't in that moment, he wasn't trying to protect some store goods. You know, right. He was. He was protecting his own life, and that's totally. But different. it's part of that he shouldn't have been there. It was only property, and it you know without saying he had the right to just mow down the whole mob. Uh, he did have a, at least as much right to be there, probably more, because he was hired by a business owner trying to protect their property. Yeah, well, <laughs> he, he was asked by the owner of the car dealership. Yeah, and, even if they uh, had to deny it for their own safety. Yeah, and they kind of weaseled out of that. Yes. And it's just, yeah, um, I think it's, this started with uh, rent being optional. You know, when I was a property manager, like we had at one point at the height of COVID, a third of our tenants, they didn't pay rent and they had no shame. They just, oh, you're a rich landlord, but we don't have to pay, even though they're getting like $800 a week on unemployment. Uh, yet no respect for property ownership. Yeah. I mean, in California, there's like, like your own talked on a show last night. There's like these flash mobs, like going in, stealing like a hundred thousand dollars in jewelry or, you know, going into Macy's and, and Dwayne Reed and just, you know, um, apparently a security guard got killed in one of them. Yeah. And they had a off duty police doing this. Um, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. No respect for property. It's just not considered a legitimate right. But do you, you know, see how, you know how part uh, of that they, they used to have, I don't know if it still is, they used to have a, a law that if, you, if you're convicted of a, of a crime three times, it was automatic life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm three not strike sure. law. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's still on the books in, in, or if, if it is Took in it what state. In what sta did they? Yeah. Yeah, um, they did, yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember having this discussion about 20 years ago with Jim Valiant, who was, uh, you know, a prosecutor in the San Diego County. Sure, uh, he's been on the show. Yeah, well, Jim Valiant's a great guy, and his book on, uh, on Christianity is brilliant. Um, but um, I, I advocated then, and still do, that if, if somebody's convicted of, you know, of three crimes, that it should be automatic death penalty, not, you know, not uh, life imprisonment, but death penalty. And... Um, <laughs> You know, and, and, and I and I still you could tell you could tell I grew up in Brooklyn. I don't like thugs, but uh, Andy, you know, Andy, are you talking about violent crimes or no any crimes? So you know, so I mean, well, pickpockets or shoplifters, if they're convicted three times, execute them. I you know, and, and I and, and I, again, I think I think it's morally the right thing to do. We broadcast this all over the country for years and years in every form of of media that if you're convicted three crimes, you're going to get killed. You're going to, you know, the, the state's going to execute you. And so it, it's very simple then to uh, protect your life. 
don't commit any crimes. I don't think crimes. that's where society is right now. No, I'm just saying what I think is morally right. We, we need, to, we need oh. to defend innocent people against bad guys like of, of all kinds, even if they're minor bad guys like pickpockets or shoplifters. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I believe in a basic sense of proportionality. The problem was with these existing three strikes laws, it would always you'd always see some story about, you know, the guy did two horrible things. And then like on the third one, he stole a pack of gum. And now he's been, you know, sentenced to 25 years. Well, well, well I mean, you know, first of all, he shouldn't have done the horrible things. Uh, but but second of all, having done those two horrible things and knowing what the law states and knowing the, the moral foundations of that law, he better make damn sure that he walks the straight and narrow for the, you know, for the rest of his life. Well, Andy, sure. the issue I have with the three strikes law is that you you end up prosecuting people for prior issues. So mm -hmm. I believe that you should be um, punished for the crime you committed. So the, the real problem, I think, fundamentally, is we don't properly punish people. If someone rapes a woman, I think, and it's definitely proved, he should probably be executed. I don't, I I don't, agree. Think, I agree. I don't think we punish people properly. If we punish people properly, we wouldn't have this, um, this desire to have a three strikes law. I think that's... I, I, I hear you, William, but remember something. If, if we have the three strikes law and, and the punishment is execution after the third uh, conviction, uh, and somebody is convicted a third time anyway, does that not tell us that this is a career criminal? Uh, I, I, and I think we honest people have the right to, you know, to defend ourselves in the ultimate way. Execute, well, I would ask, execute where, where would, you, would you draw a line? Because, I, again, I go back to like a teenager stealing things. What if... What if a teenager gets caught stealing three times? I think with you're talking about with somebody who's underage, somebody who's a minor. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so sympathetic to adults who are criminals, but let's say you're dealing with an immature young man. And yeah, I understand. We're dealing with we're dealing with minors. It's yeah. it's it, it changes the situation. But I also want to point out, I you know I've been reading a lot of uh, true crime stories. Uh, in in the la in last year for for various reasons about the gangs, you know who who terrorize the projects in you know various cities New York Chicago and Baltimore St Louis and and so on, and you know a lot of these kids, um, they they commit their first murder by the time they're like fifteen, and uh, it's even a, it's a status symbol for them you know they they have to have to put in the work as yeah. they as they call it and so you you, you have you know kids who are hardened, they're, they're murderers by the time they're 15 or, or, or 16 or, or multiple murderers. Um, so what's the morally right thing to do with, with, you know, with teenagers who are, you know, they're underage, they're, they're still children, but it's, it's, it's just the most, it's the most disheartening, dismaying situation because on the one hand, they're children. And the other hand, they're hard, they're hardened killers and they'll shoot somebody on sight for wearing, you know, the colors of a, a rival gang. Uh, and, you know, what's the morally right thing to do? With well, these, I, these I mean, these, it, they're children, but it, they're I killers, mean, but they're children, but they're right. killers. But I think a lot of that is drug war and welfare state related. And without a doubt. Oh, without a doubt. Rid of that, I think most crime would not exist. But also, I think there's an issue of determinism, right? You're saying, well, you know, this person was a criminal. Is he always going to be a criminal? Doesn't we? Doesn't he have free will? You know, and people often tend to age out of crime. Like, let's say you're 16, you do a lot of stupid things. By the time you're 30, you settle down. I'm mean, not everyone, but there is statistics showing that. And also, well, uh, the, these gangbangers, little gun busters, as they're known in the projects, a lot of times, by the time they're 20, they're dead, you know, uh, and the cause of death is homicide. It's not, not by the cops either, but by well, other gangs. But I'm just right. saying in terms of a criminal mindset, I don't think it's determined that if someone was a criminal, they're always going to be a criminal. So we have to execute them. I don't, I don't think that's realistic. I mean, I think I think you're right. People people have free will. But right. I mean, but I mean, how many crimes, how many crimes honest people have to tolerate before, uh, you know, we're convinced that so and so is a, what they criminologists call a career criminal. There, there are people I mean, they're making choices, but right. but they uh there are a number of people who 
make those choices for year, year after year after year? How, how many crimes do we need for them to commit to be convinced that this is the choice that they're going to keep on making? And these three strikes laws themselves were really a reaction to other soft on crime policies that weren't keeping people in jail for the first crimes that they did. Well, if we kill the bad guys, we don't have to worry about it, right? They're not, they're not going to perpetrate any more crimes against, <laughs> against innocent people. Those no, innocent people that we need to empathize with. You know, Ayn Rand was against the death penalty. And uh, yeah, well, you know, I uh, disagree. You know, I, I disagree. I disagree uh, as well. I, I, yeah, I'm actually going to be writing an article on this. So hopefully I'll have some more to say on it in the future. But Ayn Rand was against, she kind of. Um, yeah, on epistemological had, grounds, as I, as I recall, right? Yeah, okay. she, she kind of had a yes and no answer to the question of the death penalty. So she said that epistemologically, you can't be certain that someone um, deserves a death penalty because you can't like, when you can't prove that they killed a person. So there might be a mistake in the, in the justice system. So therefore, she was against the death penalty on epistemological grounds. But morally, she said, um, she thinks that anyone who kills someone else, you know, murders someone should should suffer the death penalty. Yeah, right. Well, murder, not shoplifting. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I mean, I'm sorry for laughing. It's not funny. That's why I advocate the, the three strike law. If somebody's convicted three times, uh, you know, it's it, the pattern. The pattern is there. And, and, and I think I think stringent I think str stringent rules of evidence should need to be required, you know, in a criminal case to 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 make sure that the the convicted person is guilty. Human beings are fallible. You know, the jury can make it can make an error. But if you have stringent laws of evidence, you know, we're doing everything we can to protect the rights of the accused. Well, I want to switch gears just a little bit here about general lessons from this episode in history. I think part of it is that, uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and as the rule of law abates, something will fill its place. Uh, let's hope they stay as good as Kyle. I, I think there's a deeper problem in the liberty movement. Some have decided that there's nothing we can do but train more intellectuals. And once they've decided there's nothing more to be done, everyone who wants to do more is basically smeared as tribalists, pragmatists, unprincipled, shouldn't have been there, etc. I think we're going to see more vigilanteism as the police are getting further and further neutered. Um, and there's really no solution to that other than to have a philosophical revolution. Right. But we shouldn't just, uh, you know, be so quick to just say, oh, they're the bad guys, when in fact it's a reaction to yes, I agree. growth from the left over the years. Yeah, they came down on Kyle before they came down on the rioters. I noticed that. It was... Yeah. Michael Malice said Kyle Rittenhouse's biggest crime was doing a better job than the government in keeping Kenosha safe. That's true. And I, I think Dave is right. I think we're going to see more vigil, vigilanteism. And I think morally it's, the, it's necessary. If, if the government's not going to do its job to protect innocent people, their lives and their property, then I think uh, uh, you know, private citizens will, will need to do that. Uh, and I think it's the right thing to do to protect the innocent and their property against really bad guys. Um, so I think, I think it is going to... Uh, be more prevalent, and I think it's uh, I think it's morally right, and I think I think people who are libertarians or objectivists uh, uh, who claim to or who claim to be and and are attacking these people, I think they're wrong. I think I think they're wrong on moral grounds. Um, yeah. the The other piece was the way that uh, Kyle was painted as a white supremacist by the liberal media. I mean, that, that's like uh, them saying we were racist for voting for Trump over Hillary. I mean, he shot white people. <laughs> yeah, and, and they put they put out the the rumor for a long time uh, that his victims, or well, they're not victims, but the he was the victim, but that yeah. the perpetrators who was uh, uh, assaulted him and that he shot were black. I mean, they just the the lie in leftist media just lies uh, about it. Yeah, they called them Black Lives Matter members, and then 
other people made the assumption, I think, but it's still, it was out there even after the verdict. Yeah, there's still people who believe it, that, yeah. the, that the people written how shot were black. Not that, think, not that that matters morally. The self-defense, self-defense, the moral, the moral principle of self-defense holds no matter what race, you know, any anybody involved in the in the struggle is. But in today's context, when it's so racially charged, it's just it's just the lie in leftist media, uh, lying or well, at least at the very least, giving the implication that 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 the other that these guys he shot were black uh, to try and you know just to to fuel. Their big lie, Hitler called it the big lie, right? That white supremacists are, are a prevalent are a prevalent threat in right. America today. And making him believe that he was a white supremacist was a way to say, "Oh, you know, he did it." Yeah, and the, and, the, and it is a big lie. The 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 good news here, I mean, white supremacists is bad news. White supremacists are evil, uh, you know, and and they uh, often violent, you know, murderous. The Klan. And, you know, and, uh, creatures like that, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, they're evil uh, and they need to be fought and they need to be stopped. But the good news is they are, a, uh, mercifully, they are a severely marginalized factor amongst 234 million white Americans. Right. They, they are not a prevalent threat, much less the, the greatest danger that, that the country faces, which I think Biden uh, claimed. No, when they use white supremacists, they mean us, anyone for capitalism, Ayn Rand, you know, you name it, anyone to the right of Joe Lieberman, basically. Yeah, and, and who's white is, is, is automatically a racist. Exactly. <laughs> to be white is to be a supremacist to them. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big lie. And um, now, but, like, well, can I ask what you think? Now, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, I think, is pretty clear cut. That was self-defense. But what about the Ahmad Ar Arbery case where that was an issue they thought he was stealing? And then they took, they were vigilantes. They went with a shotgun to confront him and they ended up killing him. And now they're looking at life in prison. So that's a little bit of danger when you don't offload your violence to the police and you take it upon yourself to do these things. My, yeah, understanding, I my limited understanding, because I didn't watch that trial or read much about it, but I, I thought that the um Ahmad Arbery he reached for the shotgun yeah. or they were trying to make a citizen's arrest and then he resisted yes yeah so that that's a question in itself is did were they permitted to make a citizen's arrest and what are the standards for doing so um yeah and I don't have a real strong opinion about that but I think it depends on the context again if you're in a riot situation where the police they couldn't maybe they couldn't rely on the police to hunt this guy down um, and they had to take action themselves. Does that mitigate their uh, goal, their um, culpability? Yeah, and I, I didn't follow the, that case carefully, so I don't know the facts of it. But um, the the victim was black, and the perp the perpetrators were white. Is that right? Right. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And now in today's context, that's uh, you know th that super, unfortunately it's so irrational, but that supersedes facts so you know if they were acquitted could you imagine what the results would have been of uh burned of down every the country for three months yeah yeah and, <laughs> and and the authorities not doing anything to stop it part stop. of this part of the racist rhetoric or racial rhetoric that you hear all the time from the media i think it's causing a real problem among just normal people it's causing racial tension so this Maybe Ahmad Arbery was afraid of these white guys because he saw them as just Nazis. You know, he thinks white people are white supremacists out to kill him. And yeah. so you can't trust anybody anymore if they're a different color skin. Or a different class or gender, which is, yeah, they want class war, race war. Uh, yes, that's what they want. Everyone that's a, like a, a, it causes a breakdown in social connections you know and so yeah. black people can't trust white people white people can't trust black people so when if a white guy tries to make a citizen's arrest on a black guy that black guy is going to be like well why are you doing this are you for real you know are you really going to take me to the police you know he's got all these questions in his mind yeah yeah you know after the riot in charlottesville when was that august 2017 right. um you know i i wrote an essay the you know the left pushes america towards race war published it and then linked to it on Facebook. 
And I, and I noticed this, this was four years ago. I, I, I noticed a lot of comments on Facebook. Well, no, that's not going to happen. You know, race war is not, you know, not, not the future. I've been afraid that the left is pushing us towards race war for a long time. In fact, I've written a novel on, on that theme, which I haven't published yet. But, uh, you know, next year. But um, and it's a powerful story, too, if I say so That's myself. That's a gutsy subject. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be demonized. Uh, <laughs> I am going to be demonized by, by the left. But, you know, you stand up for what you think is right. Um, and uh, and um, they, it is the goal of the left. You know, they, they have, first of all, we need to point out that Nazism or National Socialism is a form of socialism and collectivism. And, you know, if... If left means socialism, collectivism, and right means capitalism, individual, individualism, then the Nazis are national socialists are as leftist as, as are the communists. But what's, what's really scary is that the Marxists today, the, I think of as the, you know, Richard Spencer and those guys, I think of them as the national socialist left or the Nazi left. And, you know, and then the Marxists, you know, the, they're, the, they're, the, they're the Marxists left. And notice they've incorporated race war. With, Dave, you're right. They've incorporated race war elements into their uh, essentially class war ideology. And it's no, no longer just the rich oppressing the poor. And now it's the rich whites oppressing the, the poor non-whites. And they've reversed favored and disfavored races. But it's still, it's a Nazi element. It's a national socialist element. They've incorporated into an essentially Marxist ideology. And now they're pushing us towards a hybrid uh, type of totalitarian state. Not that it makes any difference whether it's communist or Nazi. It's just, I'm just pointing out. It's not just, they're not just pushing us towards communism anymore. It, it's, it's got this hybrid Nazi, this racist element uh, to it. Yeah, well, I mean, even the, you know, communists were doing uh, gulags before uh, Hitler was doing concentration camps. He got some of his ideas from Stalin. Oh, without a doubt. And Lenin. Let's not let's not excul exculpate Lenin and Trotsky. Those guys, those were really those were really bad guys. Yeah. Oh, 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 definitely. Um, My understanding was didn't the first concentration camp the idea it came out of Plato? It was from the Republic. Like all these ideas of equality, material outcome, and the idea of uh, concentration camps. That's like a, a spinoff of Plato. Well, Plato was definitely advocated totalitarian state. You know, and the rule of the you know the philosophic elite. I, I don't remember the Republic well enough to say whether there were concentration camps there. Or not. You, may be, you may be right, but um, race war is, is terrifying. And, and what you guys are saying is, is, is right. And, you know, early, earlier this century, you know, let's say, let's say uh, pre-Obama, uh, we, we had made a lot of progress, you know, on, on, on race relations. And you, you, you didn't hear as, you know, as much, uh, about it. And I, and I think Obama is as much an effect, maybe even more an effect than he is a cause. But he, he did help, you know, he, he did help uh, revitalize this racist ideology in America. Absolutely. But, but fu fundamentally, it comes from postmodernism, Marxism and, and, and postmodernism dominating the universities. But I mean, we become so race conscious. This is what you were saying ju just before. Um, we become so race conscious that, you know, the they have us at each other's throats, uh, you know, and race, race has become dominant again. Obama contributed to that, um, but he's not, the, he's not the primary, he's not the primary cause. And it's terrifying. We are, we are being pushed towards, towards race war. And uh, the consequences of that is going to be thousands and thousands of innocent people killed. Do you, yeah. I mean, do you see nationalism or Nazism as more of a reaction to the left or would you consider it an aspect of the left? Well, I think national socialism is socialism. It's as fully socialist as is communism. You know, your life has, be, your life has be, become socialized. Your life belongs to the state. It's, you know, it's, it's race war socialism in, in contrast to class war socialism, but they're both full, full socialist systems. But the socialists were internationalists, whereas the yeah, nationalists right. were about the nation and the race, and then the socialists were about the class. So, but maybe they're, they're just two forms of the same thing. But I guess right wing collectivism takes the shape of nationalism and racism a bit more. See, the problem I have, you, you, you're right about that. The Marxists are international socialists, and the, and the Nazis and fascists are national socialists, which is the very name of their, of their party. The problem I have with calling them right wing is, well, where is individualism and let's say fair capitalism then on, on that political spectrum? 
it, surely it can't be the middle ground between two forms of collectivism. That that logically, you know, makes no sense. I think if I, I think of it, if we're going to use the left and right metaphors, spatial metaphors, and I and I think they're useful if we define them properly. You know, I shorthand. Then I think we have you know the the national socialists and we have the international socialists, but they're both socialists, a full socialists, because that means your life has been socialized. Your life belongs to the state, and they not to you. And they both proclaim that one hundred. 100%. Um, so, but yeah, you're right. The, the, that's the, the, the one difference between them is international versus national socialism or, you know, class war versus race war socialism, you know, but they're all socialists. And we need to make, we need to make that point. But the current right wing, like in the United States is a mix between an individualist capitalist philosophy of the enlightenment and the nationalism kind of immigrant bashing xenophobia of the Trump era. So you have this mix, whereas the left seems to be completely collectivist, altruist. Right. And that's why I've been arguing for a long time now against many good friends of mine, longtime objectivist friends of mine, <laughs> family members, you know, and so on, that the conservatives are less bad than the leftists because the left is completely, uh, they, they've abandoned any elements of individualism that they might have once had. They're not Americans anymore. They're Germans, you know, and I don't want to bash Germany too much because German culture has been magnificent in many ways. But German philosophy has been very harmful. Uh, the Hegelian Marxist and you know, the left is they, they, well, I can't remember the last time I heard a Democrat say anything about individual rights or, or even personal liberties. But the conservatives still have some element of that. You're right, Dave. They're, they're, so they're, they, they're, they're a mixture of Christianity. Uh, now, in the, in recent years, nationalism, which is a form of collectivism, Me Too socialism in following the leftists, and still some last element of Americanism, you know, of, of, of individualism and individual rights. But their very mongrel, eclectic uh, mixture uh, makes them makes them less dangerous because they're not full. You know, they're not fully consistent in one irrational philosophy. Furthermore, as bad as religion is. And I, you know, I had this debate with Ernesto Souza uh, a, a while a while back, you know. Um, and Christ, you know, Christianity is irrational. All religions are irrational. But I don't think Christianity, even at its worst in the dark ages, as bad as it is, is as bad as National Socialism or or communism. I wrote a whole essay on that uh, this past year. So it's for, for for various reasons, I think the conservatives are less bad than the leftists. Mm -hmm. And and when I vote. I'm looking to buy time. And I think, you know, to, to promote objectivism, which is the only hope, I think, of saving America as a free society in the long run. And I think the, uh, the conservatives are less bad, less virulent, uh, and consequently will buy us time more than the leftists will. And interesting how Leonard Peikoff, who I respect enormously, um, and always have, uh, you know, in, in the dim hypothesis, he certainly uh, thinks that religion is the, is the long-term danger. I think Lenin may, Lenin may still think that religion is the long-term danger. But in the last few years, he's come to uh, say that the leftists are the short-term danger and they have to be, you know, it's going back to the Obama years, uh, that the leftists are the short-term danger. And he, uh, he said that when Obama was president. And then in the last election, he said he was voting for Trump. And I know he contributed modestly to the Trump campaign. So, uh, I think he still thinks religion, I don't want to put words in Lenin's mouth, but I think he still thinks religion is the graver long-term threat, but he thinks that yeah. collectivism in the short term is, is more dangerous. I yeah. certainly agree. If, if that's the case, I certainly agree with him in the short term, but I also think that collectivism is the worst long-term threat as well. I think he's, I, if, you know, I'm interpreting this, but I think he's come to see CRT slash wokeism as that religious threat, like a lot of us. It, it could be. I, I, you know, I haven't spoken to Leonard Peikoff in in years, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I just put it hypothetically, uh, you know, if if that's what what he thinks, then um, if if he thinks that, I don't know, I don't know. Um, when he was talking about religion, he was talking about traditional Christianity, wasn't he? I mean, in the yeah. in the dim hypothesis, he was talking about egalitarianism, and um, as as the predominant uh, disintegrating force, right? Yeah, he, 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 said the, he said the religion. It's been a while since I read the book. I, I, yeah. I, think he, I, think he, I think Leonard was saying that the left would, would disintegrate because of its very nature, 
you know, and the conservatives or the, the religionists have a, a, a full philosophy, misintegrated though it is, and, 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 and they're, the, they're the, the worst long-term threat. But I could be misremembering here. I don't want to- I, I have a post uh, on this, this exact issue about uh, Leonard Peikoff's political evolution over the years. We may end up doing a show on it because I think it's fascinating and, and something that almost no one else is talking about. Yeah, I remember, well, I remember 2004, I, uh, when Lenin said he thought it was immoral to vote for Bush, um, you know, he gave a bunch of examples of why religion was such a threat. And I, you know, I, understood, I understood what he was saying, but I thought that Bush, bad as he was, was less bad than the Democrats. And I, I voted for Bush in 2004. Hell, I would vote for Bush today if he's running against anybody, that, almost anybody in the Democratic Party. You know, if, if Tulsi Gabbard comes back today, if Tulsi Gabbard comes back and uh, and runs, then I'll you know then I'll as a Democrat then I'll vote for her. But uh, uh, almost anybody in the Democratic Party, I would vote for Bush today. I, and I, I I agree. You 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 did you guys see my debate with the Sousa on Christianity? Yes. Yeah. You know, so I gave I gave a whole bunch of reasons why Christianity is irrational and deadly, and and the, the Sousa, who I respect in other ways because he's written some very good books. He never even tried to answer my uh, objections. He then came back and said how these secular philosophies of communism and national socialism are worse. And I responded by saying, I agree with you. And what does that make Christianity? The second worst evil, you know, in Western history? And I, I think the debate was decided right then and there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I agree. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think Christianity is the second worst evil in Western history, but national socialism and communism are the worst. So that's why... Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to support these people, even though, and that Texas abortion law is heinous. I mean, it's just horrible. But, you know, on a wide range of issues, I'm, I'm, I'm not a one issue voter, on a wide range of issues, I think the conservatives, uh, people like Christy Noem, for example, you know, uh, are better on a, on a wide range of issues than, than the Democrats are. So I, I think, think traditional, it buys us time. I think traditional religions like Christianity, especially here in the United States, they've been defanged by. Uh, the enlightenment and reason and science uh, they yeah. and they're and they're stuck in their dogma dogmatic texts so they they can't really get away from the bible too much so but they either have to reject it or turn it into some metaphor they can't, yeah. they can't. you know that's exactly the verb i use with the Sousa, that christianity has been defanged by the yeah. you know the rational principles of the enlightenment but we haven't had that opportunity yet to defang the left because they're inventing new myths as we speak. It and they control the universities and the intellectual culture. Right. Yeah, okay. So, I, a couple things to say. So first, it's interesting. We have to acknowledge that most of the smart people are on the left, like the productive people in, uh, uh, in universities, academia, Silicon Valley. Why is the right not able to attract these highly productive people who determine the course of a culture. I and think people uh, are uh, largely caving to the left when they get into the university system and realize they need to, to survive. I think Ayn Rand said it best. She said the, the right is out of ideas. So, I mean, we, I think that's why I, I think we should enter the right full heartedly and start pitching them our, our, our ideas because they are out of ideas. And I, I like what I, another quote from Ayn Rand that I really like is you know, it's, it's earlier than anybody thinks. And um, the, the left has uh, Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto in 1848. And, you know, and Marx died in 1883. By the time uh, early in the 20th century, you know, roughly World War One, you know, Marxism had become a, you know, a strong force in the American universities. Yes. And by, by the 1930s was, was the, the already, you know, it's called the Red Decade. Whereas Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957. So uh, it takes a long time to, to change the dominant philosophy uh, of, a, of a culture. Uh, nevertheless, you know, even having said that, that it's early, it's, it's, only, it's only what, 60, uh, 64 years since the uh, publication of Atlas Shrugged? Whereas, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're coming in, in 2048, 27 years will be 200 years since the publication of the Communist Manifesto. Even so, even having said that, I'm troubled that there aren't more, you know, bright people who are reading Atlas Shrugged and, and you know, and, and really understanding objectivism and, and speaking up, you know, and, you know, becoming prominent, uh, productive people. 
like in Silicon Valley, for example, you know, that, you know, that there should be people like Elon Musk or you know, Steve Jobs when he was alive, or, you know, Bill Gates or people like, you know, their equivalent who do great things in their field, who, uh, you know, read Atlas Shrugged and understand it and, and, and have the, and have the stones to stand up and speak out. In fact, I'm, I'm troubled that, that that hasn't happened. 64 years, I would think would have been enough time, especially when, well, yeah, I'm troubled by that, but I think it does take a long time to change the culture and we have to just keep, we have to keep fighting. And, and uh, I think we have, we, we might have, I, th- I agree with you, William. There may be a chance to introduce objectivism uh, uh, amongst the conservatives. It's hopeless amongst the leftists. It's, it's the only chance hopeless. or else it's going to be us sitting on the sidelines and saying, oh, you see the right turned bad after we did nothing to try to influence them. Yeah. I, I mean, politically, there's other things, right. you know, we could do, but politics is, is a battleground, you know, and it's a battleground where we have to engage. And I don't even, I don't even love politics that much. You know, literature is, is my love, but um Politics affects our lives. What was that what was that quote from Tolstoy that you may have no interest in evil, but evil has an interest in you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you may have no interest in politicians, but politicians have an interest in you. And we have to, for those of us who love freedom, even if politics is not our passion, we need to stand up and fight in this in this battlefield. It's downstream from culture, like Andrew Breitbart said. It's certainly downstream from philosophy, as Iron Man taught us, but it is a battlefield. We have to fight on it to preserve freedom while mm-hmm. we're fighting on these other battlefields as well. And I agree with you, William, the, the conservatives are much less bad than the leftists. And the, the, our only hope is to introduce Ayn Rand to, uh, in and amongst the, the conservatives. Absolutely. Yeah, and by the way, there were, there were these Christian objectivists, right? right. I, don't know if, I don't know of any Marxist objectivists, but I know they're <laughs> Christian objectivists. And that's a, good, that's a good sign. Well, let me make one more point on this. And then I want to talk about your new book. Um, so what I think is important as well as just pitching the right our ideas is our posture, um, the way we approach them. I think we're too um, combative with them. We're, we're always harping on their negatives. Um, but I think if we slightly adjust our posture and begin with how we agree with them about the left and how we want to help them fight the left, then we can also bring up our ideas on you know, what, what we think they're doing wrong and what they can do better. And so I, what do you think about this posture idea? No, I know. I think you're right. Uh, there are certain things we share in common with the conservatives that we don't share in common with the, with the leftists. Uh, the, you know, the, the conservatives to some degree support capitalism and uh, the leftists uh, want to destroy capitalism. Um, also related to that, because of the the faith-based belief in an individual soul it's faith-based and it's irrational nevertheless there's an element of individualism there you know to real to real My christians <laughs> yeah you're right exactly it's personal it's a personal soul and to real christians they take individuality seriously you know every, everybody is a child of god we're, we're not gonna you know we're not gonna um be willing to kill thousands of people in order to have a perfect, you know, collectivist society. To, to a true Christian, um, the soul is personal and, and it's sacred and it, it's, it's a, it belongs to God. And, you know, it's faith-based beliefs, but at least there's an element of individuality there. In, individuality is real uh, to, the, to the religionists and it's, and it's important. It's good. And, and I think that's, um, you know, I think that's something we share in, in common with, with, with them. And it's important for, for in, in the political context. It's important because it's then then we have allies um, in individual rights uh, against the total collectivism of the left. And when we acknowledge that, we may be able to reason with the religionists and say, you know, faith-based beliefs can't establish the sacredness of individuality, but we have a rational argument that does. Speaking um, of. Working with religionists, I wanted to, uh, we did something on the uh, Dennis Prager Ayn Rand video, which was in third place of all YouTube videos with Ayn Rand in the title. And uh, it's actually now moved to second place with uh, almost 6 million views. So uh, congratulations to TOS for that. Yeah, con- yeah, congratulations to Craig Biddle for that, definitely. Uh, one one way to combat the left is is to produce entertaining stories for people so they can see the difference between leftist literature and good literature. Um, 
William, I know you uh, enjoyed Heart of a Pagan, and uh, we're going to be reading Brooklyn Stories for Christmas. Can you tell us a little about the new book? Let me let me switch let me switch the video here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I I I've been reading your fiction. Uh, I read Heart of a Pagan. Um, I don't know when it came out, but it, it had to be like seven or eight years ago. I read it, yeah. and I really. I really enjoyed it, and I, I I read it in like two days. It was a really fun read, so I'm really looking forward to your new book, Brooklyn Stories, and I hope you'll tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I sure will. Thank you, thank you, William. But uh, so you were talking about you know good literature in contrast to the collectivist. So you know, should we uh, should we contrast the Fountainhead with socialist realism? I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it certainly it, it certainly should be convincing the people. Fountainhead. And Atlas Shrugged, these mag and Anthem, these magnificent novels, and socialist realism is just boring dreck. Uh, you know, it's all about toiling for the masses and, and everything. Anyhow, here's, uh, you asked about the Brooklyn stories. Here's, uh, here, here's the book, the, the cover of it, great mm -hmm. cover up by my good friend, Bosch Boston. Um, and it's a, it's a collection of, of 10 short stories. Takes, take, they take place in Brooklyn. One of them actually takes place outside of Brooklyn. But, but the, the kid, the kid had been reared in Brooklyn. But we won't, we won't quibble. Uh, if if I if I say so myself, there's some there's some really good stories um, in here. And uh, can I can I read the can I read the blurb from my good friend Jim Valiant? Sure. Uh, uh, James Valiant is somebody I have a lot of respect for. Even you know prior to this blurb that he wrote, that, this praise comment for many reasons, he's a brilliant guy. Uh, you've, yeah, like you said, you've had him on the show. Yeah, and his book, uh, "Creating Christ: How How Roman Emperors Invented Christianity," I'm no expert on this field, but my limited knowledge, it is the most innovative, even revolutionary uh, idea on Christianity's genesis, maybe maybe ever. I mean, that's how that's how it's original. a novel theory, absolutely. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. But here. It, uh, Jim, Jim Valiant read the, the stories and he wrote, Andrew Bernstein is one of the great writers of our time, maybe any time. In his latest collection of stories, he takes hold of the reader by the emotions and tours the soul through a dazzling spectacle of tragedy, heartache, inspiration, and heroism. You will weep, you will agonize, but you will also experience the potential of the human mind and heart at its finest, and thus you will be moved. This is yet another display of literary artistry in its highest form from a writer of subtle genius, unquote. Wow. Nice. I, uh, wow. And he can be quite critical. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a brilliant guy. Uh, so I mean, coming from, coming from an intellectual and writer of his stature, they, I mean, this really has, wow. That's wow, great. that's, uh, but I do think, I do think there is some, some, I don't want to boast too much, but I do think there are some really, really good stories in, in, in this collection. And, uh, you know, and it's it reasonably priced. Was it was at $18.99 from, uh, from, from Amazon. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of, of some of these stories. And there's, let me read, let me read what I, what I wrote on, on the back, just to give an example of what some of the stories sure. are about. Will a philosophy professor overcome heartbreak and anger at romantic betrayal to collaborate with his triumphant rival on writing the novel they both cherish? That's the essence of one story. Can a high school teacher and former Marine reared in a criminal family protect from that family's murderous intent, his innocent best friend? There's a little vigilanteism in that story. Yeah. Way, guys. <laughs> uh, can a brilliant boxer clean the hood's mean streets of brutal thugs and win back the girlfriend that his neglect permitted to be savagely assaulted? A little more for but I don't, I don't want to. Uh, how do multiple survivors of a violent school invasion deal with the aftermath of the tragic event? Uh, so there's, there's different, different kinds of stories. You know, some of them are violent. Yeah, that's nitty gritty stuff. That's good. Uh, this got this got a Brooklyn edge to it, guys, uh, and but but I you know they're not all violent, by the way. I, I say <laughs> I, I know a lot of people don't like violence. I understand. I, I hate it myself. 
uh, which is why I well, why I think bad guys need to be dealt with, you know, uh, severely. You know, those who initiate force. But um, I, I took the two violent, real violent stories, and they're, they're nine and ten. They're the two last stories in the collection because I didn't want somebody who's got a sensitive soul to stop reading. You know, at the beginning of the book because two of those stories are violent. So I put them. I put them at the end. And well, I'm glad a, you said that because now I'm going to read those first. <laughs> Well, I, I, my personal opinion, trying to be as objective as I can, story number 10, the aftermath of a school invasion, is violent. But I also think literarily, I think it's the best story in the collection. Uh, although there are some other good stories. And for people who don't like violence, I understand a number of these stories are about college professors. I mean, I'm a college professor. So you, you write about what you know. A number of them are about college professors writing books, romantic relationships, you know, uh, you know, things like that. When uh, your podcast with uh, Bosch, it's uh, weekly. Is it what, Wednesdays? Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday night, eight, eight to nine thirty Eastern time. OK. All right. Good. I see it on Facebook. Uh, I don't know if it's other places, but. Uh... Yeah, it's we stream live on Facebook and it's uh, it's uh, archived at Rumble. We got deplatformed at YouTube after like five <laughs> That's like five episodes. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. We, we brought on my, my friend, uh, Todd Albanese, who's an objectivist attorney. Actually, you know, Dave, I could ask Todd about all these uh, the legal issues that you were raising before. Um, but he's an attorney in the, in the Dallas area, and he's followed you know, the, the 2020 election carefully. And we brought him on to discuss, raise the question, of, you know, was there wrongdoing in the 2020 election? I think that, I, I think that's a forbidden topic and uh, you can't raise that as oh, a great. question. Oh, great. Now you're going to get us kicked off YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll, 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 okay. No, we'll All take, right. we'll take the risk. Uh, yeah. Also, we, also the week, the week YouTube deplatformed us, Bosch had arranged for Robert Spencer, who's an expert on Islam, you know, to oh, come sure. on the show. And I don't know if that was, if that played any role Oh, you know, that could have too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but anyhow, we're archived on on Rumble. So, well, that's great. Well, um, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, again, um, Andy, the book is uh, Brooklyn Stories. It's available now on Amazon. Amazon and uh, Barnes and Barnes and Noble dot com. The Brooklyn Stories, subtitled, a rousing collection from New York's most colorful borough. Very I, nice. I, I think it lives up to that. <laughs> Dave, anything you want to, uh, any last thoughts? Well, if I could just ask Andy, okay, is he, uh, this is about uh, him pitting religion against collectivism. It strikes me they're the same thing. Like, are the Islamists, Muslims, any less collectivists than the communists? It's just two forms of the same. I don't know why one would be less evil than the other. They seem like equal, equally barbaric. Well, I mean, that's an interesting philosophic point, Dave. Do, guys, do we have a few minutes to discuss that? It's up to you. You tell us. We'll go longer if you want to. Okay, because Dave raised a really, a really good question. Um, you know, with, with, with religion, of course, with, you know, our lives belong to God and to the collectivists, our lives belong to the state. So that the... There, there are variations on, on evil. Neither one does our life belong to, you know, my life belong to me or your life belong to you. But they're not, they're not identical. You, you know, uh, religion is otherworldly. Collectivism is thisworldly. Like I said, religion worships God. Collectivists worship the state. Where, where I think you have a strong case, though, Dave, is, uh, is the conformity that we see in so many religions. You know, if you, if you get 100 people who are true believers, a whole cross section, Jews, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Hindus, how many of that 100 as adults accept the religion that they were born into and reared it? You know, probably like 95 or more, right? Maybe 99 out of 100. Some people convert, but it's, but it's, it's very rare. And so I think there's just this, there's this conformity. You know, I was, uh, you know, I was raised in this religion. 
my parents are this religion, my friends are this religion, I've known the clergy since I was a little kid, I've gone to that church or that synagogue, and there's a conformity to the group. That, that, is, that is a form of collectivism, and I think it's undeniable in, uh, in, in religion. Very few people who are religious, in my experience, and I know a lot of them, and, 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 and having read about many, it's very few do this, you know, they're raised as Jews, let's say, or they're raised as Catholics or whatever it is, and then they get to be adults, and they do this careful study of comparative religions. Aha! The one I, the one I was raised in just happens to be, you know, the, 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 the best. No, they just conform to the group. So I, so I think you're right about that, Dave. I think there is a powerful element of, uh, of collective. Conformity to the group for, is a form of collective. For me, I, I think you still have to differentiate between each uh, group. And uh, because, you know, sometimes the, the dogma on the rise is a bigger threat and more dogmatic than the one that's been around for 2,000 years and had to make compromises with reality, if only to survive. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's true. You know, I published an essay in, in TOS a few months ago on uh, on Judaism, and uh, Reform Judaism coming out of nineteenth century Germany has been a, has been a very powerful force for good. It broke the it broke the uh, control of orthodoxy, you know, on on the Jewish people, and it it um, Reform Judaism is barely a, a religion, certainly certainly compared to. <laughs> I, I grew up in a Reform temple. We, uh, I called it a uh, stopping ground on the way to agnosticism or atheism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, what was his name? Uh, Geiger, right? Rabbi Geiger. I, I don't remember his first name. I, uh, who was one of the originators of Reform Judaism? You know, did did a lot of good in breaking the the back. You know, the real power of you know of, of organized religion over this relatively small small group of uh of people but yeah, we just got to get them to stop voting democrat yeah <laughs> yes yeah that's 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 right but um yeah i think what, what, one of the things that to me makes religion less evil you know and, and you know we did a a show with Farazi ginsburg the i ran center uk back in yeah. the winter with uh harry binswang and, and you know and we, and we debated this, you know, and they titled it brilliantly, the Olympics of evil, does it matter who wins? <laughs> you, you know, and that's a perfect title, you know, and I, I argued that I thought, you know, collectivism is more evil than religion and Harry argued that they're equivalent or maybe religion is even, even worse. Uh, but the, the two, quickly, the two reasons why I think religion is less evil. Remember Hank Reardon thinking in his mind at one point in the story about inches of evil, and this may be millimeters of evil. I'm not, I'm not defending religion. I'm just saying, it's, you know, it's less evil than, than Hitler and Stalin. It's a pretty low bar, you know, but um, one is free will, especially, and I'm going to use Christianity here uh, as, as the main example, because the Christians almost always, they would give, they would give you this choice, convert or die, which is brutal. It's a brutal choice. But it is a choice. You could convert to Christianity, you know, and, and, and save your life. Whereas the Nazis, if you're an inferior race, you don't get to choose, you know, uh, your, your race. You don't get to choose membership in the National Socialist Party. The communists, if you're raising a bourgeoisie, you know, they, they're going to they're gonna kill you. Um, and you know, there's no choice involved. And respect for free will is, is, a, is an element of respect for the human mind. And then there's what I said before, the personal soul that Christianity uh, believes in and even venerate. And so there's some element of individualism there that we don't find in the collectivist. So I think for those two reasons, I do think Christianity uh, is less evil than national socialism and Marxism, uh, which, which is what I told D'Souza. It's the second worst evil in the, you know, in, in, in Western history. But also, I get you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I think also Christians, they don't have any power, right? Who is the Marxists have power in the, the universities and Hollywood, the, the intellectuals, who are activists are are secular collectivists whereas the christians yeah. they go to sunday you know, church on sunday you know they're not too powerful uh, no you you're, you're right dave I, I i gave a talk at at Toscon a few years ago in virginia you know on on ayn rand's novels and um i think it's collectivism in ayn rand's novels but i pointed out Every villain, without exception, in an Ayn Rand novel is a is a modern day collectivist. Whether it's Anthem, uh, where it's some I don't know hybrid of fascism or communism, in, in, in it, We the Living, where it's the Soviets, you know, in the Fountainhead, it's Tui, who's a Marxist, in Atlas Shrugged, again, it's the socialist collectivist. 
it, there's not only not a religious villain in Ayn Rand's novels, you have to search just to find the religious character. You know, you know uh, Kira's sister in We the Living was a candle lighting icon, you know, worship, worship, uh, worship. Uh, there's very few, uh, what's his name in the Fountainhead? Uh, Hopton Stoddard. Stoddard. Yeah, Hopton Stoddard is, uh, is religious. There's very few even religious characters in, in Ayn Rand's novels. And I think there's two reasons for that. And Dave, I think you mentioned one of them. In Ayn Rand's time and our time, the collectivists are much, are much more powerful than the religionists are. And so uh, they're the ones who need to be stopped. Now, I, I, that's very clear. I don't know if Ayn Rand would agree with me on the second point, she, she might not, because she was very strong. I'm old enough to remember she was very strongly opposed to Reagan uh, in, 19, in 1980. But um, I think, like I was been saying, and I said to D'Souza, I think collectivism is more evil in an absolute sense uh, than, than Christianity anyway, for the reasons for the reasons I just gave. Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand might disagree with that. She was very strongly opposed to, to the Reagan presidency in, in, in 1980. I don't, know, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember that, but I can remember. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, well, that, uh, that's great. Thank you for uh, that uh, very extended answer. Um, I know you've got uh, something you, uh, you're you uh, working on and- uh, Yeah, my I book just... on education. I'm writing that's a book right. on education. And boy, talk, talk about a topic that's timely and needed that, <laughs> to, try and, to try and, you know, help save the American educational system. So I'm, as soon as we get off the air, I'll get, I get back to work on that. That's great. I love that work ethic. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, but thank, um, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, William, any uh, final thoughts from you? Uh, sure. I just want to thank Andy and Dave for coming back on the program. I really appreciate talking to you. And I think we had a really excellent conversation. I would like to have a, a sh another show on Christianity and really delve into the nature of Christianity versus the left or, you know, as a form of collectivism, because I have a lot of thoughts on that. So maybe we can do that at some point. But once yeah. again, thank you very much for coming. And I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Well, Great. yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. And if you want to discuss Christianity versus collectivism at some point in the future, I'm, you know, I'm certainly happy to do it. Wonderful. We appreciate that. Well, Dave, thanks a lot. Uh, this has been the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff, along with William Swig, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys.